This is MJ. I'm an author, I'm an artist, I'm an analyzer. You can find all my work at mjmunoz.com. Join me as I analyze the thrilling Red Panda Adventures number 8, Curse of Beaton Hall, featuring a hotel, a hasty honeymoon, and a haunted hotel. That's, that's two hotels there. I did not mean to do that, but I'm not going to fix it now. Too bad. I'll have to be more careful next time. Perhaps it was too early in the morning. Curse of Beaton Hall originally aired April 15, 2006. It was written and directed by Greg Taylor, and here is the copy from DakotaRingTheater.com. Beaton Hall, an idyllic resort not far from the city, an oasis from the cares of the world, or a spider's web of danger and death. When the guests of Beaton Hall begin to meet with a series of unfortunate accidents, the press decides the old family manor must be cursed. The city's greatest champion suspects murder rather than misfortune. Can the Red Panda and the Flying Squirrel defeat this deadly game, or will they become the final victims of the Curse of Beaton Hall? So I'm going to launch right into my analysis of this, and uh, first of all, uh, actually, I'm I'm, going to belay that, and I'm going to stop myself and say, I liked this episode, it was good, it was fun, a lot of good moments in it. Lots of cute moments between Kit and Red Panda. And uh, <laughs> there was, um, like, I don't mind it. Uh, and it didn't bother me, except for in the wider context of things. There is a, uh, a he too moment, I would say, where uh, Kit basically tries to coerce Red Panda into kissing her in front of all the guests. Or, well, yeah, kissing her in public in order to sell their... Uh, their shtick as a married couple on their honeymoon uh, at this hotel. And uh, I just thought that was kind of funny because, you know, if he had tried to say, oh, you know, uh, this cover ID would work better if you kissed me, kid, uh, that could be uncomfortable. And I don't think Taylor would write something like that. And it's just ironic that Kit can write it, and it's fine all day long. Um, but it's it struck me as odd, and I thought, isn't that, like, you know, sexual harassment, technically, that she's trying to do on her boss? And, um, he just, uh, de-escalates the situation, diffuses the situation by doing one of his, no, no, I don't see that. That's not what's going on here, uh, things. And, uh, you know, it works in the context, but, uh, and it is funny, um, but it's also, uh, I don't know, it's just kind of poignant, <laughs> uh, a little, uh, odd and, uh, yeah, that's it. Okay, so moving on to the good, real good stuff. Uh, that couple in the beginning of the episode after the intro, that Charlie and Susan, who uh, they were killed, and Red Panda read about it in the paper while Kit was driving them around, and that's what sparked them going to Beaton Hall. Their scene was really good. Uh, I think, um, gosh, I think that's, uh, I don't remember the guy's name. I like his voice all right. I think he, I think he's asked to do like a more hammed up, you know, fancy men voice. Oh, darling, surely this must be wrong. He was Peter. Uh, he was the guy who played Peter in the, uh, um, oh man, the rabbit, rabbit season episode. So, um, like there's nothing wrong with his performances. The style of them is, you know, he's been asked to do these like over dramatic, you know, socialite guy, um, you know, never worked a honest day in his life type of person, which again, I think he does a commendable job. I believe the lady who does the, the voice of his wife though, is <clears throat> Judy Florio who ends up doing, uh, the voice for, uh, Harry Kelly for a long time, which is an important character coming up. Um, maybe next season, maybe he's a season three guy. Cause this is still season one anyway. Um, and, uh, he's a kid. So that's why she does his voice. And, uh, anyway, I think she does a fabulous job. Um, got a great range as a you know a w- woman, and then also as as the kid later on. Um, and she's played like a tough or something too um, in one of these episodes. So uh, anyway, I like her performance a lot. But like, especially her terror and his, because he was trying to put her at ease. So her terror really sold it. <clears throat> and then eventually, when he freaks out, and then they're like you know choking to death. Um, I thought both of them did really well, and it honestly did make it creepy, especially with all the the laugh track and the the. You know, the, I don't think they had the chandelier crash, but, you know, they couldn't get through the walls or anything like that uh, of the maze. That was really creepy and effective, and I thought that was excellent, excellent work. Um, <laughs> uh, I thought it was funny that, you know, after they had discussed this case and Red Panda suggested they go in 
to the country as a you know married couple to disguise their identities further and allow them to operate there without drawing attention to him this big socialite uh being there that she almost crashed the car <laughs> and like he didn't either didn't pick up on it which is odd because he's you know this great detective in the red panda or he chose to ignore it which i i think is actually the case as you'll see later on there's a lot of i'm going to choose to ignore this for the sake of you know keeping things normal and good or whatever um but, you know, she almost crashes into a lamppost and then she says, uh, like, that's funny, first of all. And the, the like, sound design on that was good. There was a, a screeching and a honking and whatever. And um, then she says, oh, he just jumped out right in front of me, which obviously a lamppost did not do. Um, and she's, like, too flummoxed by the whole situation to even make up a good excuse for why she almost crashed. And that was a lot of fun. Uh, and then I like them uh, going in to Beaton Hall as John and Jane Morris. Um uh, that was a lot of fun. I actually, the first time I listened to this, I thought, I wonder if he's going to turn out to actually be John Morris or John something or something Morris. And there's like a little clue there for who the Red Panda's real identity is, if we ever find out one day, which I'm sure we won't. Um, and uh, that was kind of fun. Um, although I did think it was kind of weak that they're John and Jane. I mean, you can be a little more creative than that, right? Um Seems a little too obvious, but sometimes, you know, couples have those names that just go together like that, and that's kind of funny. Um, and then the whole thing with the uh, the attack uh, by the mystery killer and the crashing chandelier, that's like very classic, um, you know, trapped in a manner, um, or even like Phantom of the Opera type thing. And it was, uh, it was cool. I liked it. It was like, just, it was very classic mystery and uh, I thought it was a lot of fun. It was done very well. I did think it was odd that they used close... Clarissa did another Landon, uh, voice of the flying squirrel, um, and Kit Baxter for the laugh, because while she has a great creepy laugh, it sounds too much like her. And, uh, I almost wish they had like lampshaded that a little bit in having her make a comment and, uh, about it, but it, I don't think it happened. Maybe there was like a very soft <laughs> lampshading, but it didn't quite, uh, quite work for me. Um, but I thought it was interesting, uh, that they did that. Especially because, you know, she's not the only one who can do a crazy, wicked laugh like that. Or they could have modulated it, or they could have done something to make it a little uh, more seamless, the fact that that's, you know, just her laughing. It sounded like the flying squirrel laughing a little bit. Um, so, that was, uh, that detracted a tiny bit, but still not uh, to a major extent. And then, uh, they didn't really use any gadgets, there wasn't really any lore going on in this episode. Uh, the villain, uh, I, I kind of don't want to spoil it, I'm not sure why, uh, is the Beaten Bastard. And, you know, that is a clue, but it's also not telling you who it is, and if you haven't listened to it yet, it's a reason to go back, and or to go ahead and listen to it. And, which you can find uh, links to decoderingtheater.com uh, in the show notes here, on mgonos.com. And, anyway, it was, uh, it was a cool, it was a cool way for it to go. It was a cool villain idea, and I liked the plot that he had, and what he was trying to attain, and how he was trying to do it as well, because they go into a little bit of that, and it's neat to have, you know, this mystery set up, and then have our heroes unravel it, and it was made it all a lot of fun. So, anyway, that's uh, all I have to say about this one. Let me know, uh, excuse me, let me know what you thought about the episode or any of the stuff that I said. You can make a comment over on mgonios.com or any of the places where this is published. You can make, uh, if you'd like to help me keep this going, uh, go ahead and like, subscribe, comment, all that good stuff. Give me a positive review and tell other people about this project that I'm doing and about Red Panda Adventures so they can check it out and listen to it and enjoy it as much as you and I are. Anyway, until next time, folks, this is MJ signing out. I hope you enjoyed that. Go to mjmunoz.com to leave any questions, comments, or other feedback you might have. There you can find all of my analysis, art, and fiction. I cover books, tokusatsu, comic books, anime, and more. Look around. You're sure to find something else that you'll enjoy as well. This has been a Story Over Everything production.